Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. I crash on the floor, hitting my nightstand, causing my alarm clock to fall on my head and bounce to the floor. So I'm lying there cursing myself and looking under the bed. There's nothing there. And I mean nothing. The meager light in my room should penetrate at least a few inches into the darkness, but it's like a wall of black shadow, an empty void, and I freeze with fear. Suddenly, two small blue orbs of fire appear, directly eye-level with me, the eyes of some unknown being staring into my soul. Its breath was the worst part. I would see it and smell it at the same time. I only know it was breathing because it came out in a fog, like when you're outside in winter, only it wasn't cold in my room, and the breath upon my face was cold enough to chill me to the bone. And the stench, ugh! It was as though someone took dead animal carcasses and dirty diapers and lit them on fire with a thousand matches, like sulfur or burnt hair. My mind would be screaming, run, hide, but my body is frozen. I'm hyper aware I can feel every muscle in my body tense up in preparation, but nothing happens. Then it grabs me. I see nothing, no limbs of any sort, but I'm being dragged under the bed. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. People around the world make photographs of something very strange, a phenomenon called orbs. Orbs exist, but where do they come from? Are they energy beings? Do they come from outside of physical reality? Although there are many theories of their original source, the orb phenomenon has not yet been fully explained. We do not know what the nature of the orb is, whether they are ghosts, aliens, angels, or perhaps energy beings we know nothing about. The phenomenon is so widespread that it raises a lot of interest among both scientists and ordinary people. The first orbs were observed in flash photography at the beginning of the 20th century, and they were thought to be the film's illumination or camera defects. It turned out, however, that the cameras were getting better all the time and the orbs were coming out all the time. According to what the most popular theory says, these small, translucent spheres of light visible in the photographs are manifestations of ghosts. The appearance of these orbs is accompanied by a mysterious change in the electromagnetic field that can be measured with an EMF sensor. Created unconsciously, they are thrown out when trying to contact a human to whom they remain invisible. Interestingly, they are perfectly seen by animals, 
and cats are especially sensitive to their presence. Photographs of orbs are usually made in cemeteries or places deemed haunted. They also appear in pictures of funerals, weddings, and family celebrations of a spiritual, meditative nature. Most often, however, we see them on random photos. According to some observations, they appear to announce death or tragedy. The orbs are seen on pictures taken shortly before death, and most often they cover the face of the photographed person. The closer to the date of death, the stain is stronger and clearer. Another theory suggests the orbs are energy balls of unknown origin, and based on research, their activity increases in the vicinity of crop circles. Is it possible that energy generated by crop circles also attract orbs for some unknown reason? Some researchers say orbs show signs of intelligence and want to contact us. Other proponents argue that small, bright globes are nothing but angels who take care of us and are linked to healing processes. Orbs penetrate through matter with equal ease to pass through a human being as well as through the wall. They're not visible to the naked eye, they can only be seen through the lens. The nature of the orbs was also taken by serious physicists such as Stanford University professor William Tiller and Professor Klaus Heinemann, Ph.D. in experimental physics from the University of Teubingen, Germany. There is no doubt in my mind that the orbs may well be one of the most significant outside of this reality phenomena mankind has ever witnessed, says Professor Klaus Heinemann who worked for many years in materials science research at NASA, UCLA, and is the co-author of The Orb Project. Will they prove one day that the non-material world exists? Orb expert Professor Heinemann has photographed the orbs not only in relation to spiritual events, but he also found appearances of orbs in more commonplace situations of life. Some experiments were directed to yield more information about their speed of motion, expansion and contraction, intelligence, the mechanism of light emission, and differentiation between photographs of light spirits, orbs, and dark spirits. Particularly, attempts of 3D stereo photography of orbs yielded interesting and unexpected results. Cognitive scientist Donald Hoffman, University of California, has suggested we live in a conceptual prison and only see glimpses of reality. Hoffman argues that we only see what is necessary for our survival. If he is correct, orbs could very well exist in our world, only we don't see them very often because they are unimportant in our daily lives, until someone dies and that's when they manifest themselves and we can perceive this mysterious phenomenon. Can biocentrism, Robert Lanza's theory of everything, shed more light on the orb phenomenon? According to the biocentrism theory that is based on ideas of quantum physics, life and biology are the central pieces to being, reality, and the cosmos. It explains how life creates the universe rather than the other way around. As some already know, the multiverse is a theory in which our universe is not the only one but states that many universes exist parallel to each other. These distinct universes within the multiverse theory are called parallel universes. Could orbs be energy beings that reside in either a parallel universe, another dimension, or an invisible world next to our own? Could this explain why these entities manifest themselves to us only occasionally? There are no solid answers to these questions because there is still so much we don't know about the nature of our reality. Up until a few months ago, I lived in an apartment in Manhattan with a roommate. We moved last summer and everything seemed fine for a while. It's hot in August, so we have the AC window units running at night. It starts to cool off in September, so we turned off the AC and it was quiet at night. The first incident I noticed was when I heard what sounded like rustling in my dresser drawers. 
Because I'm a rational person, I dismissed it and told myself I was half asleep and that it was nothing. In the days and weeks after, I felt something jump on my bed in the middle of the night and walk around. But again, I ignored the incident and in my half-asleep state of mind thought it was my roommate's cat. Then I remembered that my door was shut and the cat could not be in my room. This happened several times, so I knew it wasn't just in my head, but I didn't mention it to my roommate because I didn't want us to scare each other. In October, I got a dog, a sweet little chihuahua that was very quiet and never barked or made noise. In the middle of the night, she would suddenly wake up extremely alert and stare at my bedroom door, growling and snarling. I couldn't do anything to calm her down, and she never reacted that way to the cat that was also still in the apartment. This happened almost every night, and I still hadn't mentioned anything to my roommate. One night we were at a bar, having a few drinks, and I decided I had to tell her what was going on. I told my roommate about the dresser noises, the footsteps on my bed, and my dog growling at nothing in the middle of the night. She looked horrified and told me the exact same things happened to her. Strange noises, feeling things on her bed when the cat was nowhere to be found, and the cat acting very strangely, staring at things and suddenly running away to hide. Once we had completely freaked each other out, we were on high alert, exactly what I'd wanted to avoid, and things started to get worse. I continued to hear weird noises and feel steps on my bed. My dog continued to growl at night. Then, one night I felt a lot of pressure on my chest, like someone or something was pressing on it. I couldn't breathe. We also had two incidents where my roommate and I were both home, sitting at opposite ends of the apartment when a bottle of vodka tipped over for no reason. My roommate witnessed this, and it was the Crystal Head Vodka, a skull-shaped bottle that is short and bottom-heavy, not something that randomly falls over. A bottle of vinegar also crashed to the floor and shattered for no apparent reason. The last thing I can remember happening is the towel incident. One day I went to the shower and left a towel hanging on a rack right next to the shower. I'm certain it was there because I used it to wipe my eyes while showering. However, when I got out of the shower, the towel was lying on the floor at the opposite end of the room. There was no way for me to accidentally drop the towel and then toss it 10 feet across the room. I kid you not, I was so terrified that I wound up going to a church to get holy water and use it to bless the apartment every week. Nothing happened after that. The dog stopped barking. No more objects fell over. No more footsteps on the bed. Now for the strangest part. I had googled my address many times to see if anything bad had happened there, but I never found anything. When I finally moved out, I received a text from my mom saying that she hadn't wanted to tell me while I lived there, but that she'd googled my address and came across an article about a New York writer who had lived in my apartment and committed suicide. Not just the building, but my exact unit. I couldn't believe she had kept this secret for over three years, but I'm glad I didn't know and that my roommate and I were not insane. I am so happy I moved out. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. 
Weird Dark Roast Berry Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Berry Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Situated in the heart of England, Tutbury Castle is situated on wooded slopes overlooking the winding River Dove, with spectacular views across the plain of the Dove to the beautiful Derbyshire Hills. Occupied since the Stone Age, the castle is first recorded in 1071 as one of the new castles built to stamp the authority of the Norman conquerors across the Midlands. Since then, the castle has played an important part in English history on many occasions, both in warfare and in peace. The castle is best known as one of the prisons of Mary Queen of Scots, who was incarcerated there on four occasions. It was here that she became involved in the plot that ultimately led to her bloody execution at Fotheringhay. Tutbury has a long tradition of ghostly happenings, and here are just a few of the most famous ones. The Keeper Wearing a full suit of armor and behaving in a manner that might best be described as authoritative, this ghostly figure has been seen stepping out in John of Gaunt's gateway and bellowing, Get thee hence! Although last sighted in daylight about four years ago by a visitor who complained that an idiot of an, an actor had told him to get over the fence, recent increases in paranormal activity might suggest that another visit could be imminent. When it was pointed out that no enactors were on site that day, and that similar ghostly apparitions had been reported by other unsuspecting visitors, the response was, I'm sorry, but I don't believe in ghosts. Mary, Queen of Scots Tutbury was Mary's most despised prison. She suffered much at Tutbury, and was at the castle as a captive of Elizabeth I on four occasions. She was seen all in white by some members of Her Majesty's services. In 2004, at approximately midnight, she was seen standing at the top of the South Tower by a group of men in the form of a figure dressed in a pure white gown. When they saw her, they all just laughed, believing the curator was just teasing them by putting on an Elizabethan gown as a joke. When it was pointed out that curator Leslie Smith does not have a white gown, and neither does any other Elizabethan enactor working at the castle, the men were profoundly disturbed by this sighting. She was also seen rapidly crossing the grass one hot afternoon in 1984 by a serving Marine. Recently, there have been a number of sightings of Mary, especially between 10.15 p.m. and 11 p.m., a figure dressed in black is seen standing at the window of the Great Hall as cars leave the castle. In May and June this year, she was not only seen by senior members of staff, who are usually quite dismissive of such reports, but also by archaeologists participating in a seasonal dig at the castle. Film and TV Many paranormal TV shows have been recorded at Tutbury Castle. For ghost lovers, the castle was featured on Most Haunted and The World's Biggest Ghost Hunt. In September 2005 and April 2006, Tutbury Castle hosted the national Most Haunted Convention. In October 2004, Tutbury Castle welcomed 2,000 people on a one-night ghost hunting event. Some visitors come from as far afield as Paris to spend a night in Tutbury, Regular ghost hunts, including the popular Haunted Happenings events, are still held at the castle. It all started when I was about eight or nine years old. Actually, I guess it may have been earlier, but that's around the first memory I have of it. See, I've had sleep paralysis as long as I can remember, although it's rare now that I'm an adult. 
Most people that I have told about this have assumed I'm just scared of the dark or have bad nightmares, but that's not it. Although I am, and I do. <laughs> I have always had vivid dreams. When I was dreaming, I was there. I could see, smell, hear, and feel. I was also a very adept, lucid dreamer, having the choice to affect my dreams at will. That didn't work on nightmares, though, and I often had nightmares before these episodes. Horribly vivid nightmares almost every night. Dreams of falling, fire, death, being alone in empty spaces, but mostly monsters. Those were the worst. Some of them were your classic 80s slasher film icons, Jason, Freddy, etc. I think my mom let me watch those movies a little too young along with reading Stephen King, but she is still my hero. Those usually involved running and hiding while being in a strange place, usually creepy abandoned buildings or out in the woods. The monsters that didn't come from movies were way worse, though. Dreams come from your subconscious, supposedly, so I guess somehow my mind created them, although as a child it seemed like they were from the depths of hell twisted, grotesque things, sometimes vaguely resembling a human form with missing limbs or too many, hideous faces with skin missing or eyes hanging out of sockets. Some were not human at all, however. Giant creatures with wings and razor-sharp claws and teeth, black shadows with red eyes that would just stand in the corner and watch me while I went about mundane tasks like homework or watching TV. Sometimes I would wake up before they got me. Not always. People say you're not supposed to die in dreams, but I have many, many times. I have fallen and hit the ground. I've burned up in fire, been stabbed and sliced. I've even had a dream where I was at a funeral that turned out to be mine. I didn't go back to sleep that night. Well, I'm not really scared of the dark, per se, or even scared of the nightmares. I'm afraid of waking up in the dark. Let me explain what a typical night was for me when I was younger, and maybe you can start to understand. I would fall asleep in my bedroom with the TV on, mostly for light. Sound would be just loud enough to make out what they were saying. Sometimes I'd fall asleep on the couch with the light and sound coming from my parents' room before I had a TV in my own room. Then the dream would start. The worst one ever, which I had often, I don't know how rare reoccurring dreams are, but I feel I got more than my fair share, would start with me waking up in my own bed. I would be viewing as though from my own eyes rather than third person, as a lot of dreams were. I would look over at my alarm clock and it would say 3.33 a.m. Always. Then the fear would start. I knew what was coming, but powerless to prevent it. I would slowly place my feet on the floor and stand up while stretching and yawning. I'd start to head for the bathroom. Not sure how I know the bathroom was my destination as I never made it there. And I would trip on something. I crash on the floor hitting my nightstand, causing my alarm clock to fall on my head and bounce to the floor. So I'm lying there, cursing myself and looking under my bed. There's nothing there, and I mean nothing. The meager light in my room should penetrate at least a few inches into the darkness, but it's like a wall of black, shadow, an empty void, and I freeze with fear. Suddenly, two small orbs of fire appear, directly eye-level with me, the eyes of some unknown being staring into my soul. Its breath was the worst part. I would see it and smell it at the same time. I only know it was breathing because it came out in a fog, like when you're outside in winter, only it wasn't cold in my room, and the breath upon my face was cold enough to chill me to the bone and the stench. Ugh. It was as though someone took dead animal carcasses and dirty diapers and lit them on fire with a thousand matches, 
like sulfur or burnt hair. My mind would be screaming, run, hide, but my body is frozen. I'm hyper aware. I can feel every muscle in my body tense up in preparation, but nothing happens. Then it grabs me. I see nothing, no limbs of any sort, but I'm being dragged under the bed. Then I am in total blackness. I can feel its disgusting breath on my neck and hear my heartbeat, but my sense of sight has totally abandoned me. I don't feel arms around me specifically, but I am being held there. It feels like someone has wrapped a blanket made of flesh around me, but it is stronger than I am and holds me completely still. Then I feel its tongue slowly lick from my neck to my ear as though tasting my fear. In a voice I can only describe as broken glass soaking in blood, gravelly and grating but wet, it whispers, What do you like about laying under the bed? That's when I snap out of it. I struggle and fight, swinging my elbows and kicking my legs hard as I can, eventually loosening the creature's grip, and I would wake up. Here's where the real fun begins. I would be completely frozen, sometimes to the point where I could not even open my eyes. Sometimes that would be all, just frozen for a minute or two, then I would snap out of it. I'm getting a little freaked out even writing about it. The memories are that vivid as it comes out. Other times the nightmares followed me. I remember once I was lying there frozen, trying to force my eyes to close when I heard that same thick, gravelly voice say, Come back under the bed. The games were just starting. I couldn't turn my head to look toward the sound. Not sure I would have even if I could, but I could feel its cold breath on my ear. I guess I must have screamed, although I don't remember doing so, because my mom ran into the room and turned on the light. I swear I saw a shadow out of the corner of my eye melt into the floor, heading back under the bed. She checked, assured me there was nothing under the bed. I still don't know what to believe. According to the therapists and counselors I have talked to, I was experiencing visual and auditory hallucinations common to sleep paralysis. They don't know how real it was, though. When I would wake up in bed, once able to move, I would jump off my bed, making sure to stay well away from the edge, run to my parents' bedroom and crawl into bed with them. Sadly, until I was about 14, Oftentimes, though, I would not wake up in my bed as I had fallen asleep. Sometimes, after that specific dream, I would wake up on the floor next to my bed, which was the worst, especially if the paralysis kicked in, which was often. I've woken up on the couch, on the floor in my parents' room, on the kitchen floor, in the empty bathtub, even on the porch. On these occasions, I would sometimes find scratches and cuts on my body, often small, although once I had a six-inch gouge across my rib cage, still have the scar. The therapist said this was due to sleepwalking and running into things. My grandmother had a very different view of things. I loved my grandma. She definitely wasn't your regular sweet old lady. My grandmother had a deep appreciation for the occult, when I told her about my dreams, she crossed herself and did that weird little evil eye hand gesture. I asked why she was freaking out. My dear, 3.33 is a time of evil, she explained. 3 is a number of Satan. 3 a.m. is the witching hour, dear, when the veil between realms is thin and reality can be warped. It was more likely that it was an actual demon trying to drag you to the underworld you're lucky to have survived the attacks. She also told me that I wasn't sleepwalking, as the therapist suggested, but actually in another, I guess you'd say, alternate plane or dimension or even the underworld. We always thought she was a little crazy. Now, I'm not so sure. I wish she was still alive to help my family. 
Recently, my seven-year-old son has been waking up in the middle of the night, right around 3.30 a.m., screaming about the monster with blue fire eyes. I was holding him after one recent episode, telling him it was a dream and he will be okay. He kept repeating the word, no. When I got him to calm down a little, I asked why he was saying no. He said he doesn't want to play under the bed. Three times each day, I take our small dog for a walk. The way we go varies as I spend the time thinking about ideas for this and that, and Millie wanders around the village with me in tow. She knows where she wants to go and I just follow. We started out early one morning during the winter and made our meandering way from tree to tree as she smelt around for every dog which had passed that way recently leaving little drops of pee everywhere herself. If you share your home with a dog, you'll know exactly what I mean. It often seems to me that she must have had an invisible tank somewhere, but as I say, you know what I mean. This particular morning, it had started to snow at first light. The ground was covered with a soft carpet of white, and parked cars looked like small mounds on wheels. We wandered around and finally came to a small alley called Monk's Walk. In the olden days, monks from the ancient Archbishop's Palace had passed this way on their way to their own small chapel a mile or two away from the village. It was a daily penance to walk barefoot to prayers across the sharp flint-strewn paths, and they made the journey several times a day. Millie loves this pathway. It opens out to a good-sized grassy area where she can run free, safe from the busy road, and also has a neatly laid-out children's playground with a good selection of swings, slides, and roundabouts, as well as a small picnic area with wooden tables and benches. The day was bitter with cold, the gray skies above threatening more snow before the morning was out. I pulled up the collar of my sheepskin coat and thrust my gloved hands deep into the pockets it really was cold. Watching Millie running around, I mused on how cold her paws must feel to her, although it apparently had no effect on her enjoyment of being out of our nice warm house with its underfloor heating. I was looking forward to getting back home myself and settling down with breakfast, coffee, and a newspaper, then jotting down a few more words of a screenplay I'm working on. I did the pooper scooping thing. We like to keep the village neat and clean, and made my way over to the bin at the picnic area. As I approached the tables, I became aware that a small child was sitting on one of the benches, facing me across the table with her chin supported by her hands. She was very nicely dressed in a fashionable and good-quality coat of a style popular with those who can afford to shop at the likes of Harrods and Selfridges in London. Of course, here in a good middle-class Kentish village, this was no surprise, as quite frankly, one needs to be wealthy to live here, and most folk in the village commute to their work in London. The surprise was that she was here at all, sitting at a picnic table covered in snow and early in the morning, far too early to be on her way to the village school. And anyway, I knew most of the local kids at the school. Their parents were my neighbors and my friends. She looked up at me from under the hood of her coat and smiled. It's a lovely morning, she said. I love the snow. Well, yes, I said, it is a lovely morning, but much too cold to be sitting here in the snow so early. Is your mummy here with the dog? Mummy's gone, she said, with a kind of finality in her voice. But Daddy said, we will all be together soon. Is Daddy here then? I asked, looking about to see if I could see him anywhere. No, she said, Daddy went too. Look, I said, I don't like the idea of you getting very cold here, and it's before breakfast time for me. Have you had breakfast? No, we came straight here, she replied. It is very cold, though. Well, listen, I said, I live in that house just over on the corner, but I do not think I should take you there myself. 
you really should not go anywhere with a stranger. She looked at me and I noticed that small tears were streaming from her eyes. She looked so tiny too, around seven or eight years old, I guessed. I do want to see mummy, she said, and looked down sadly at the snow-covered tabletop, sinking slowly onto the surface and covering her face with her gloved hands. I'll call my wife, I said. She'll come straight over and we'll all go back to sort you out. You cannot stay here in this weather on your own. Do you live in the village? Oh yes, we've always lived here, she said. I called my wife on the mobile phone and she replied straight away. Okay, I'm on my way, she said. Two minutes. Do I need to bring anything? Just put the kettle on, I replied. Looks like she might enjoy some hot chocolate and toast with jam. We should really call the police. I think we should, she said, but let's wait until she's warm and has eaten. We might get more sense out of her then. My wife's on the way, I told the child, and you know I don't know your name. I like your dog. Is it a boy dog or a girl dog? My name is Millie. Was she playing a little game with me now, I thought? Surely she had heard me calling Millie's name earlier, but no, I had not called Millie at all. I was sunk in my thoughts and Millie had been happy with her sniffing around. No words had been spoken until I saw the girl. That's a lovely name. It's also the name of my dog, a little girl dog. A moment later, my wife arrived and said hello to the child. I think we should go to our house for a while to warm up and have a hot drink and some jammy toast while we sort you out, she said. Come on, it's nice and warm in the kitchen. Can Lizzie come too? asked the girl. And for the first time, I noticed a small bundle next to her on the bench. No problem, bring her along, she can warm up too. My wife picked up the seven-year-old, telling me to bring her doll along home with me and Millie the dog, who was now running around like a crazy thing, or as we say, having a mad half hour. I grabbed Millie as she raced past and put her back on the lead. Reaching down to the bench, I then picked up the bundle and instantly realized it was a living baby, although very quiet and its skin pinky blue with the cold. I dropped the dog lead and stood on it, leaving my hand free to open the buttons of my sheepskin coat as I tucked the baby inside against my body for warmth. I flicked the lead up with my foot and caught it, starting to jog home. I could see my wife and the little girl entering the house across the road as I closed the gate to the playground. By the time I arrived back a minute or two later, my wife had Millie sitting on the sofa, holding a hot water bottle to her chest under her open coat she still wore the pretty gloves and the hood was still up on her head. Did you bring Lizzie? She asked. Of course I did. I thought Lizzie was your doll. Don't be silly, she said crossly. Lizzie's my sister. Daddy says she's an angel and me too, of course. Now look, what we need to do now is firstly to get both of you warm and with some nourishment inside of you. Then we can talk about what to do next. You look completely perished with the cold, and Lizzie is still wrapped up inside my coat here, warming up. My wife looked at me. Did you say you have a real baby there, not a doll? Yes. I've only glanced at her, though. I thought it was more important to get her warm as fast as I could. We must be quick. Go and open up the bed, and we'll put both of them in it while we get something ready for them to eat. It's probably still warm, but wrap a hot water bottle and a towel to go close to the baby. Within another couple of minutes, Millie was warm in bed and my wife was opening the small bundle of blanket around Lizzie. My God! This baby's only a couple of months old! It is so still! We, we need to get some help here straight away! Call the hospital for an ambulance! I raced downstairs. My phone had been left on the kitchen table and made the emergency call. Then I called the local police station and asked for someone to call around, quickly outlining the circumstances to the sergeant on duty. With this done, I made a pot of coffee, grabbed cups, etc., and went back upstairs. My wife was cuddling the baby to her with a soft, warm blanket and the hot water bottle. Look at this child's face, she said, and I came closer. The baby's color had improved. In fact, the pallor of her skin had vanished, transformed into a kind of intense radiance. She now made small noises and movements, and as I looked, 
opened her eyes and gazed at me as small babies do, almost as though seeing right through you. Her eyes were as dark as obsidian, with a glowing shine like polished shell and with tiny pupils of silver. Her gaze ran through me like a hot sword. I felt a strong attraction to her and the need to keep her warm and safe. My attention shifted to Millie, tucked tightly in the warm bed, and as I looked, she turned her head towards me and smiled. Until now, my concern had been for her well-being as a small child alone in the cold of a winter morning, but now I received a feeling like being in an envelope of love as her eyes met mine. She, too, had the dark eyes of her baby sister, as deep as metallic pools, with an iridescent sheen. They attracted my gaze as a magnet attracts iron. Thank you, was all she said, and seemed to slip into a deep sleep. My wife tucked the baby in beside her under the covers and then sat down on the bottom of the bed watching them both. These are strange kids. I want to help them. They need our help. I can feel it within me. Millie the dog came into the room and laid down under the chair in the corner. I kissed my wife and went downstairs to wait for the police and ambulance, taking my hot coffee with me. Outside, the snowfall had increased, the fields and garden now covered by an unbroken blanket of snow. Within 15 minutes, there was a knock on the door. The snow had stopped and sun now glinted off of the shimmering icy whiteness of the day. A police car was parked at the corner of the road and a young female constable stood at the door. We said hello and I told her about the children as we climbed the stairs together. In the bedroom, my wife was asleep on the bed. The dog was asleep on the floor. The bed was empty. Just the two tiny depressions told the tale of its recent contents. Of the child and the baby, there was no sight. I waked my wife, who looked startled and shocked as she came to consciousness. "'Where are my angels?' was all she said, and seemed to slump asleep again. The dog whimpered slightly under the chair and a deep sense of sadness pervaded the room. The children had gone. The policewoman quickly took charge, woke my wife, and started to question us about the happenings of the morning. The siren of the ambulance just caught our ears in the far distance. As she made her notes, we looked around the house from room to room, opening cupboards and closets and wardrobes as we went. Nothing was left to search. The children had vanished as though they had never existed. We turned our search to outside the house, but still nothing could be found. The blanket of snow was a perfect covering. The only marks in its unbroken surface were the footsteps of the policewoman, left as she approached the door. Above us, two tiny birds fluttered their wings gently as they flew away from the chimney pot toward the horizon and the rising sun. We returned into the house and waited for the ambulance, the lady police officer waiting at the door while I dashed upstairs to comfort my wife as I woke her up. She was very distressed at the news of the missing children. I now needed the ambulance for her. She looked drained and ill. A few moments later it arrived, the blue lights glinting across the misty windows of the bedroom as its wheels crunched through the deep snow. The two medics were both kind and attentive to my wife, and she soon felt better. They listened to our story with interest. Can you describe the children, we were asked. We gave as full a description as we could of the clothing, the appearance, and the state of the two young things, as well as our small conversation with the girl. We went to look at the playground, covered in snow, with just the footsteps of my wife, myself, and our dog now just vaguely evident as depressions under the silky fall of later snow. The only evidence of the children was the faint marks of elbows left in the snow on the tabletop and the patch on the bench where the bundle had been. As we returned to the house, the ambulanceman whispered in my ear, "'I'm not a religious man,' he said, but I believe you've been touched by God today. That's all I'll say. I should really say nothing at all. I'm on duty and the care of the living is what I'm paid for. He would say no more. We were interviewed again by the police a day or two later. 
They took descriptions but seemed uninterested in the happening, putting it down to either a daydream or some condition of exhaustion. They did not say we were lying to get attention, but that was the underlying gist of the interview. Months later, we ran into the ambulance medic whilst queuing in a market. We chatted for a while and he asked how we were. He mentioned the children and asked about their eyes. My daughter was interested in your story, he told us. She had a similar experience with a lost child, a little child with dark eyes. The child vanished too and nothing could be found to prove it had existed. He gazed into my eyes. My daughter has had nothing but a beautiful life ever since helping that child with the deep and meaningful eyes. She believes that she and her family have been visited by an angel. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Ever had that eerie feeling of being watched? There's no one there, at least nobody you can see anyway, but still you can feel those ghostly eyes upon you, the watchers in the shadows waiting for their moment to scare you, haunt you, or something even worse. That is the theme for these carefully selected creepy true stories of the paranormal designed to have you wondering if you too are being watched from the shadows. This all-new collection includes stories about the Hat Man, Black-Eyed Kids, Shadow People, Poltergeists, UFOs, the premonitions of a dying man, forest demons, and much more, all absolutely true, all chosen by the master of the paranormal himself, G. Michael Vasey. Watched from the Shadows – Scary True Stories of the Paranormal, available now on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. Strange things were afoot in Pennsylvania in the early 20th century. A brutal murder in 1928 began a hex scare in the region, turning the authorities and the general public against what had always been seen as a common custom – the folk magic practice of powwowing. Prior to the bloody crime, the belief in and practice of folk magic was seen as nothing more than a quaint holdover from less sophisticated times. After the murder, though, it became a threat. Practitioners were no longer seen as backward or ignorant. Now they were dangerous. The folk medicine that had been used for centuries was now a false treatment that kept people from getting the real medical care they needed. There was little room for superstition and hex doctors in the modern world. To city folk, it seemed impossible to believe that anyone still believed in magic in the modern world of the 1920s but among the back roads, farms, and hollows of rural Pennsylvania, magic was alive and well. Pennsylvania hex magic dated back to the earliest days of the colony, linked largely to the Pennsylvanian German or Dutch as they were often called immigrants and their descendants. The German settlers held strongly to elements of their culture and blended customs of the old and the new world to form a distinct identity even their language became a unique dialect. Though there were a great many different religious denominations among the German settlers, there was a common tradition of folk magic that was practiced by all, with the exception of the plain Dutch, such as the Amish, who rejected the practice. For large numbers of these Germans, the belief in folk magic was entwined with their Christian beliefs. At one end of the folk magic scale was powwowing, which had nothing to do with the Native American ceremonial practice of the same name. Powwowers performed magical religious folk healing and drew their healing power from God. 
Generally, powwows provided cures and relief from illnesses, protection from evil, and the removal of hexes and curses. They also located lost objects, animals, and people, foretold the future, and provided good luck charms. To carry out their practices, they used charms, amulets, incantations, prayers, and rituals. It was generally believed that anyone could powwow, but members of certain families were especially adept at it. These families passed their traditions down from generation to generation. At the other end of the scale was hexerai, or witchcraft. Practitioners of black magic drew their power from the devil or other ungodly sources. The witch harassed neighbors and committed criminal acts with supernatural powers. Sometimes witches were called hex doctors. The term hex doctor can be confusing because it can imply many things. At times, the term was applied to powwowers who were also knowledgeable in the ways of hexerai and were skilled at battling witches and removing curses. These hex doctors fell into a sort of gray area between a witch and a powwower. Sometimes they cast hexes for a price or out of revenge. It was not uncommon for someone to seek out one hex doctor to remove the curse of another. For many Pennsylvania Dutch, and certainly for outsiders, powwowers and witches could not easily be placed into categories. There were many who labeled the use of any folk magic as witchcraft that was strictly forbidden by their religious beliefs. Powwowers and hex doctors often worked against one another, with the common person caught in the middle. It was in this setting that folk magic flourished for more than two centuries. Witches targeted their victims in many ways. Since Hexerai was based around a farming society, many of the witches' attacks were directed at animals and crops. They were often blamed when cows did not produce milk, when seemingly healthy animals mysteriously died, or when crops failed. When witches went after humans, they used a variety of torments. They were commonly suspected of causing illnesses, especially conditions that lingered and caused a person to waste away over time. A witch could also use spells to launch invisible attacks, causing seizures or fits, the sensation of being pricked or stabbed, or the feeling of being choked or strangled. Witches could also cause a run of bad luck for any individual that they attacked. The witch could even appear in the form of an animal like a black cat so that they could move about undetected and harass their victims. Needless to say, just about any type of misfortune could be blamed on a witch. In addition to spoken words, the written word was also used for magic. Written amulets and charms were common, and many Pennsylvania Germans carried them on their person. Amulets usually included a written version of a protective charm and perhaps verses from the Bible. The paper they were written on was usually folded into triangles. If not carried personally, such amulets might be hung in a house or barn. Ritualized objects were also used. These objects were actually mundane items, but they often acquired a special purpose. Sometimes the objects would be used as a surrogate for the afflicted or for the disease itself. Much of German folk magic depends on the principles of contagion and transference. Basically, the idea is that the evil or the disease is contagious and can be transferred away from the afflicted person and into an object. The object could then be disposed of in a prescribed manner to keep the contagion from spreading. Traditionally, this kind of magic is known as sympathetic magic, and it often worked, as long as the person afflicted truly believed that it would. Since the powwowers and hex doctors depended on charms, formulas, and incantations that were passed down through their families, they often collected them into recipe books, which contained the collective knowledge of a family line of powwowers. By the middle 1800s, these homemade volumes were joined by published volumes that came into common usage. Folk healers had always invoked and used the Bible in their magic, but they increasingly supplemented their knowledge with sources published by other powwowers. The most famous and widely read of these books was compiled by a powwower named John George Homan in 1819. 
Holman was a German immigrant who settled on a farm in Berks County, Pennsylvania as a side business. He published broadsides and books about the occult and medicine aimed at the local German population. In time, he published the most widely read grimoire or book of magic in America. The compilation of spells, charms, prayers, remedies, and folk medicine was called Derlang Verbogine Freund or The Long Lost Friend. It was the first book of powwow magic to achieve wide circulation. It has been in print in either German or English continuously since 1820. Aside from being a collection of charms and recipes, the book itself became a talisman. In what was an example of a resoundingly successful early marketing ploy, buyers of the book were told they would be protected from harm merely by carrying it. In the front of each edition was an inscription that read, Whoever carries this book with him is safe from all enemies, visible and invisible, and whoever has this book with him cannot die without the holy corpse of Jesus Christ, nor drown in any water, nor burn up in any fire, nor can any unjust sentence be passed upon him, so help me. The bulk of the book consisted of remedies and charms to cure common illnesses, fevers, burns, toothaches, and other ailments. It also contained recipes for beer and molasses, and even had a charm for catching fish. Many of the charms in the book were meant to provide protection from physical harm from weapons, fire, witches, and thieves. It also provided instructions on how to keep animals in a certain location, heal livestock and cattle, and even cure rabid animals. The long-lost friend soon became the primary reference for anyone attempting to understand the practice of powwow, and it gained a place of honor on almost every powwowers and hex doctor's shelf. As an opposite number of the helpful charms of the long-lost friend was the far more dangerous book of witchcraft, the sixth and seventh book of Moses. Drawn from the tradition of European grimoires and ceremonial magic, the sixth and seventh book of Moses were purported to have been written by Moses himself and allegedly contained secret knowledge that could not be included in the Bible. Described as two separate books, they are almost always published together in one volume, first appearing in Pennsylvania in 1849. The book soon gained an evil reputation among the German population and those who were familiar with its lore. It was associated with hexing because the text provided instructions on how to conjure and control spirits and demons. It also contained spells and incantations that were beneficial to the user, as well as spells that would duplicate some of the biblical plagues of Egypt, turn a staff into a serpent, and other miraculous happenings. Much of the volume is made up of reproduced symbols that were allegedly copied from old woodcuts. Some copies were printed, at least partially, with red ink. A few hand-copied editions were alleged to exist that had been written in blood. Though hex doctors frequently acquired the book to enhance their reputations, merely owning the volume was believed to be dangerous, and if a hex doctor actually read it, that could be fatal. Reading the book was believed to attract the attention of the devil, or at the very least cause the reader to become so obsessed with the book that they could do nothing but read it the only way to break the obsession, should such a thing occur, was to read the entire book in reverse, starting at the end and working back to the beginning. To modern readers, all of the stories and claims of spells, hexes, magic books, and incantations may sound rather silly, but rest assured they were all common traditions of the Pennsylvania Dutch country of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It might sound hard for us to believe today, but people at that time and place readily accepted such ideas. And that turned out to be the most crucial point of the Raymeyer hex murder. Those involved truly believed in magic. They believed that it worked and could ruin their lives. And they would do anything to try and stop that from happening. The hex murder, the strange killing of Nelson Raymeyer, captivated the people of the region and sold newspapers across the country. The story began with a young powwower named John Blymere, who was born in 1895 and learned the art of German folk magic at a young age. His family had been powwowers for at least three generations and probably longer. 
Although he did poorly in school, Blymeer established a good reputation as a healer in York County. Starting at the age of seven, he began providing healing remedies and cures. Despite his early success, though, he began to believe that there was a shadow hanging over him. One day, as he was leaving the cigar factory where he worked, an apparently rabid dog began running toward some of his fellow workers. Blymere approached the dog and spoke some words of a spell. The dog's mouth allegedly stopped foaming and the animal became subdued. Blymere patted its head and the animal followed him excitedly for several blocks. The other workers were amazed at the dog's apparent cure, but soon after, Blymere's luck began to turn bad. He soon became ill and he started to believe that another practitioner of folk magic had placed a hex on him, possibly out of jealousy. He soon found himself unable to eat, sleep, or work his powwow magic. Blymere used several of his own magical charms to try and remove the hex, but he was unsuccessful. It was difficult to remove a hex if one did not know the identity of the witch who placed it. Then, one night, as he lay in his bed trying to sleep, the answer came to him. Just as the clock struck midnight, an owl outside hooted seven times. It was then that the idea came to Blymere that he had been hexed by the spirit of his great-grandfather Jacob, who had been a powwower and the seventh son of a seventh son. Since he could not fight back against a spirit, he decided he would move away from his ancestral home and the cemetery where his great-grandfather was buried, hopefully breaking the spell. It seemed to work, and soon Blymere's luck began to improve, at least for a time. In addition to his work as a folk healer, Blymere performed a variety of odd jobs. He soon met a young woman named Lily, and they married. The couple had two children, but both died in infancy. The youngest only lived for three days. These tragic occurrences led Blymere to once again believe that he had been hexed. Unable to determine the source of the new hex, he turned to the powwowers for help. One of them was a man named Andrew Lenhart, who convinced him that the source of the hex was someone that he knew well. Blymere became suspicious of everyone around him, even his wife. Lily had reason to fear for her safety because in 1922, One of Lenhart's other clients murdered her husband after receiving similar information. The client, Sally Jane Hagee, shot her husband Irving in bed after Lenhart was hired to drive the witches from her home. Sally did not believe the treatment worked and was in terrible physical pain. She finally snapped one day, killing her husband and later committed suicide in jail. After consulting lawyers, Lily was able to obtain a judge's order to have Blymere committed to an insane asylum. The doctors determined that he was obsessed with hexes and magic and needed to go to the asylum for treatment. Soon after, Lily filed for divorce and it was granted. Blymere didn't remain locked up for long. 48 days after he was committed, he simply walked out the door one day and vanished. No one even bothered to look for him. Blymere went back to work at the cigar factory in 1928. While he was there, he met two other people who also believed that they were suffering because of someone who had hexed them. One of them, 14-year-old John Curry, was trapped in an abusive household and felt that a malevolent force was causing the trouble at home. Another man who believed he had been hexed was a farmer named Milton Hess. Hess and his wife Alice had been successful and prosperous until 1926, when a series of unfortunate events began at their farm. Crops failed, cows stopped producing milk, and they lost a large amount of money. The entire family believed that they had been hexed by someone, but they didn't know who it could be. The talk of hexes reinforced Blymere's own belief in spells, and he became terrified by the idea that someone was out to get him. He began to consult other powwowers again, attempting to track down the source of the lingering hex. Blymere turned to a well-known powwower in the region named Nellie Knoll, the so-called River Witch of Marietta. The elderly woman identified the source of Blymere's hex as a member of the Raymire family. When Blymere asked which of them had cursed him, she told him to hold out his hand. 
She placed a dollar bill on his palm and then removed it. When Blymere looked at his hand, an image appeared. It was the face of Nelson Raymire, an old powwower whom Noel referred to as the Witch of Raymire's Hollow. Blymere had known Raymire, a distant relative, since he was a small child. When Blymere had been five years old, he became seriously ill. His father and grandfather, unable to cure him, took the child to Raymire, who healed him. Unable to understand why Raymire wished him harm, Blymere went to see Noel again. She confirmed that it was Raymire who had hexed him and added that he was also responsible for the curses on John Curry and Milton and Alice Hess. Blymere told the other two men what he had learned and also revealed a solution for ending all of the hexes. Noel had stated that the men needed to take Raymire's copy of The Long Lost Friend and a lock of his hair and bury them six feet underground. Blymere and Curry decided to go together to Raymire's Hollow and obtain the needed items. On November 26, they were driven by Hess's oldest son, Clayton, to the Hollow. They stopped at the home of Raymire's former wife, Alice, who said that Nelson could be found at his own home, which was about a mile down the road. The men went to Raymire's door, and Blymere asked to speak with him for a few minutes. He later said that the older man was much larger and meaner looking than Blymere remembered. They went into the parlor, and Blymere asked him questions about the long-lost friend and other elements of powwowing, never mentioning, of course, the true reason why he and Curry had come. After talking for a while, the men realized that it was late, and Raymire offered to let them sleep downstairs. They agreed, and while Raymire slept, they looked for his copy of the spell book, but were unable to find it. They debated on whether or not to try and obtain a lock of his hair, but finally decided that Raymire was too big for them to hold down while they cut his hair. The pair left in the morning after agreeing that they needed more help. Blymere told Milton Hess that he needed a member of his family to help them subdue Raymire. Hess and his wife offered their 18-year-old son Wilbert as an assistant. The next evening, November 27, the three of them arrived at Raymire's house. He let them in, and they went into the front room. Raymire never got the chance to wonder why they had come back for another visit. When his back was turned, the men tackled him to the floor and attempted to tie his legs with a rope they'd brought with them. The exact details of what happened next varied slightly depending on which man told the story, but during the struggle, Raymire was beaten and strangled to death. It's possible that Blymere intended to kill Raymire once he reached the house that evening, but if he did, he did not reveal his plans to the other two men. When they realized that Raymire was dead, they took all of the money in the house, hoping to make it look like a robbery. They left behind the book and the lock of the old man's hair. He was dead. The hex had been lifted, they thought. But if that was true, Blymere's luck certainly didn't improve. The three men doused the body with kerosene and lit it on fire hoping the flames would spread throughout the house and burn it down. When they left, Raymire's body was engulfed in flames, but somehow the fire mysteriously went out. Some believe that perhaps the hex doctor was not yet dead when he was set on fire and that he might have moved enough to extinguish the flames, but had been burned too badly to survive. Regardless of what happened, evidence of the crime was left behind. Two days later, a neighbor discovered Raymire's body. The shocking crime stunned the community, but the terror and excitement that followed was nothing compared to the story that soon emerged. Alice Raymire informed the police of Blymere and Curry's visit, and they were soon picked up as suspects. As details of the events emerged, newspapers across the country covered the story of the York witchcraft murder with great interest. Every bizarre detail of Blymere's hex-obsessed life was described for the public. When the men went to trial, there were daily reports of the proceedings. Hess received 10 years in prison, but Blymere and Curry ended up receiving life sentences for the murder. Both were eventually paroled and lived uneventful lives. Curry, the youngest, served in the military during World War II and became a talented artist. The Hex murder in York County received wide coverage. 
and while the local authorities did not launch any official assault on folk magic in the area, the press and authorities in other parts of the state eventually would. The sensationalistic newspaper coverage of the case brought intense scrutiny to folk practices, and they were labeled a form of witchcraft. The press maligned all practitioners of powwowing, even if they only practiced the most benign healing services. Lurid descriptions of magic and strange beliefs filled the newspapers and shocked Americans who were unaware that such things were still taking place in the 20th century. Law enforcement officials, doctors, and educators began working together to put an end to what they considered superstitious and dangerous practices. Many of them began attributing supernatural motivations to any strange new cases that they encountered. During the Raymire murder trial, York County Coroner L.V. Zack claimed that the deaths of five children in the previous two years had been caused by powwowers. He said that the children's parents took them to folk healers when they were sick, instead of real doctors, and as a result, they died. He did admit there had been no formal investigations of these cases, but that they were a matter of common knowledge. The New York Times featured the coroner's questionable claims in an article under a dramatic headline that read, Death of Five Babies Laid to Witch Cult. The newspaper quoted unnamed officials of the York County Medical Society, who said that the coroner's count of deaths attributed to witchcraft was much too low. Soon, any death that was even vaguely connected to a powwow or rumored to have a connection was labeled a hex murder. In March 1929, the body of Verna Delp, 21, was discovered in the woods of Catasquia near Allentown. On her body were three pieces of paper with magical charms written on them, supposedly to protect from murder and theft. A coroner's report identified three poisons in her body, and it appeared that she had taken them voluntarily. The young woman's adoptive father, August Durhammer, revealed to the police that he'd recently learned that Verna was taking treatments from a powwower and that she'd been planning to visit him on the day that she died. The powwower was identified as a man named Charles T. Bells, and he was arrested thanks to the fact that the police were sure they had another hex murder on their hands. At first, Bells denied treating Verna, but later admitted that he was treating her for eczema. He claimed to only be a faith healer, not a hex doctor. The authorities didn't believe him, and even though they could find no evidence to link him to the crime, continued to hold him in jail. As the investigation continued, it was discovered that Verna was pregnant and she had not seen her boyfriend, a truck driver named Masters, for several months. She had not yet told her family of the situation and was possibly looking for a way to end the pregnancy. Even after this new information came to light, the police still believed that Bells was partially responsible for her death. The obsession with hexes and powwow distracted the police from other possibilities in the case, including a botched abortion attempt, suicide or murder by someone other than Bells. By April, they still had no evidence that Bells was involved with the murder, but he was charged anyway. He finally received a hearing in mid-April after lawyers filed a writ of habeas corpus. He was released on $10,000 bail and charges were eventually dropped. The murder of Verna Delp was never solved. The press jumped on another case of murder by powwow in January 1930. Mrs. Harry McDonald, 34, a housewife from Reading, died after receiving severe burns in her home. She had apparently been given some sort of ointment from a hex doctor with instructions to rub it on her skin. At some point in the night, her body went up in flames when she got too close to her stove. She was seriously injured, and when her husband, who worked the night shift, found her in the morning, she was on the verge of death and could not be saved. The woman's brother told reporters that he believed the lotion she was using was flammable and caught fire, killing his sister. He had no evidence of this, but the press latched on to this theory and kept the story alive with occult connections for weeks. Another hex panic murder occurred on January 20, 1932, when the body of a Philadelphia man named Norman Bechtel, 31, was discovered in Germantown under a tree on a temporarily vacant estate. 
The accountant and Mennonite church worker had nine stab wounds in and around his heart. Some of the wounds appeared to form the shape of a circle and were delivered with such force that they not only penetrated his suit and overcoat, but his eyeglass case in his pocket as well. A crescent-shaped cut was made on each side of his forehead and a vertical slash ran from his hairline to his nose. Two additional cuts ran off the vertical slash in the direction of the crescent cuts. All of Bechtel's valuables had been taken and his car was later discovered six miles away. From the bloodstains in the automobile, it was clear that Bechtel had known his attacker well enough to let him or her into his car. The case gave all the appearances of a robbery gone bad. But then there were those pesky facial cuts, which detectives surmised might have special occult significance. When it was learned that Bechtel had grown up on a farm near Boyertown, where powwow was common, the police immediately started searching for evidence of another hex murder. Captain Harry Heenley, the chief investigator, had the victim's apartment searched for any possible connection with folk magic, but all they found were Mennonite books and pamphlets. After following a few more leads, the police still had no answers, so the press began calling the mystery a hex murder. Then, in April 1937, William Jordan, 36, confessed that he and four others had killed Bechtel, who they'd been attempting to blackmail. Most of the details of Jordan's confession were not publicly released, as Bechtel had been involved in several love affairs and had a large life insurance policy. Needless to say, the case had nothing to do with magic. If these cases had been the only ones tied to powwow, it's likely that the hex scare would have died out sooner and the public would have lost interest. That was not meant to be, though, for another actual hex murder occurred in 1934, which sealed the fate of folk magic in the state for decades to come. The last true hex murder in Pennsylvania occurred in Pottsville in Shilekill County on Saturday, March 17, 1934. A shotgun blast ended the life of Mrs. Susan Mummy, 63, as it tore through her living room window while she was standing next to her adopted daughter. Mummy was attending to the injured foot of her boarder, Jacob Rice, who was seated in front of her. The oil lamp that her daughter was holding shattered as the shot tore through the window. Mummy was killed, and the other two took cover, not knowing if more shots would follow. They waited all night in fear, thinking that an assassin was lurking outside. Finally, as morning approached, Rice decided to make the two-and-a-half-mile trip to Ringtown to report the crime. Initially, the police thought the murder was the result of some backwoods feud that turned violent, but soon the case took a bizarre turn when Albert Shinsky, 24, confessed to the killing. He claimed that the killing had been self-defense and that Mummy had placed a hex on him seven years earlier when he was working in a field across from the Mummy farm. There had been a dispute about the property lines, and one day Mrs. Mummy came over the fence and stared at him for a long time, he said. He claimed that he then felt cold perspiration come over him and his arms went limp. From that point on, he was unable to work, but that was just the beginning of the torture. Shinsky claimed that whenever he saw a sharp object, it would change into the shape of a black cat with flaming eyes from which he could not look away. The cat also appeared to him sometimes when he was in bed at night. It would creep slowly across the room and jump onto the bed. The appearance of the cat made him so cold, he claimed, that he had to get up and run around the room in order to get warm again. He sought help from several powwowers, but nothing worked. His family thought that he was lying and was just too lazy to work, but Shinsky seemed to genuinely believe that he was hexed. Eventually, when he could take no more of the supernatural harassment, he killed Mummy. He told the police that the minute she died, he felt the curse lift from his shoulders. Prosecutors wanted to give Shinsky the death penalty for the murder, and the press once again emphasized the danger of the strange beliefs and practice of folk magic. Over objections from the police and the prosecutor's office, a commission of doctors ruled that Shinsky was insane and he was sent to Fairview State Hospital. He remained in mental institutions for most of the rest of his life. The case seemed to confirm in the public eye 
that the belief in witchcraft was some sort of threat to society. Practitioners of powwow still had a few defenders, though, and they retained plenty of clients, but the tide of public opinion had turned against them. Thanks to the two murder cases and the many suspected cases that were inflated by the newspapers, Pennsylvania's school system declared war on the belief in hexes, especially in the rural areas where it seemed most prevalent. It was hoped that within several years a new focus of modern medicine and science could erase these superstitions that seemed to plague the countryside. State authorities also launched a campaign against powwowers and hex doctors directly, arresting and prosecuting them for practicing medicine without a license. Combined with the sensational stories in the media and the assault on folk magic in general, many of the remaining powwowers went underground. Except for the few who retained public storefronts, most of those who continued to practice avoided the public spotlight and downplayed their work to non-believers. They continued to provide services, however, to those who sought them out. As time went on, fewer members of the younger generations showed interest in learning about the old ways of healing and hexes, but the practice refused to die out completely. Many modern healers still exist today, and while they may not be linked to any kind of witchcraft, German folk magic remains alive and well, although believers in the craft today seem far less likely to be driven to murder. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.